So today we're going to finish talking about Faraday's law and Lenz's law. So again, that's you can get a voltage by having a change in magnetic flux over change in time. Magnetic flux is B dot cross-sectional area. And so we saw that we can get a change in flux by changing the magnetic field, changing the angle, and what we're going to talk about today is changing the cross-sectional area. And so Lenz's law was just the negative sign out in front. Faraday's law is the whole thing. So changing magnetic field. And we saw that application when we were doing inductance. And you saw it in lab when you bring the magnet from outside of the solenoid, inside of the solenoid, then you generated a current flowing through that solenoid. And so you were increasing that magnetic field. And then for changing the angle, This is when we were talking about motors and generators. So generators turn mechanical energy into electrical energy using Faraday's law. And then motors turn electrical energy into mechanical energy. And so then the last thing that we'll talk about is how or one way that we can change the area and how what that setup would look like and to do some calculations. And this is called motional EMF. And remember, EMF is just a fancy way of saying voltage. So let's talk about motional EMF. And so we'll have a setup that looks something like this. So this is just some resistor R. Um, and you'll see in a moment why we need a resistor. Then I'm going to have, and these are what's in black are just wires. So that allows current to flow through them. This red bar is going to be some kind of conductor. 
some metal, but like the wires will allow current to flow through it. And then in this region, we'll have some uniform magnetic field that points out of the screen. So let's call the height of this, or I guess this would be sitting like flat on a table. So I'm just gonna call it delta y, but it's not vertically upward. So we'll call this distance y and the distance from the edge to where the conductor is, we'll call X. So if we wanted to calculate the magnetic flux, B dot A, which we can rewrite as the magnitude of B, magnitude of A times B cosine of the angle between them. Let's say that our magnetic field is 0 0.5 Tesla. Let's say say 0 0.1 meter or 10 centimeters. And then we'll call Y one meter. So then the magnitude of B is just 0 0.5. Now, what is the area of a rectangle? Or this rectangle that I drew here? Yeah, x times y. So this would become b times xy plus theta. So b is 0 0.5 x is 0 0.1, y is one. And now what is the angle between the magnetic field and the surface area vector? So remember the, the surface area points perpendicular to the surface. So if your surface is this, then your surface area would point out. So your magnetic field points out of the screen, your surface area vector points out of the screen. So the angle between them would be zero. So you would have a cosine of zero. So this magnetic flux would be 0.5 times 0.1 times the cosine of zero. Cosine of zero is one. So this would just become 0 0.05 Tesla meters squared. So that gives us a magnetic flux, but in order to generate a 
voltage or a current, we need to have a changing magnetic flux. So can you guys, I'll give you guys a minute to think about how you would, like, let's say you, you're not changing the magnetic field. How would you change the setup such that you would have a, a different magnetic field? What we're going to do is take our conductor and let's say this is the This was the initial position. And then the final position is over here. So we'll say this is still R. The height is still one meter. This was X initial is 0 0.1 meters. And let's say our final position is zero point two meters. And we'll say that the time it took to move that distance, let's say it took one second. So now, oh, and our magnetic field was coming out like this. So we calculated our initial magnetic flux. Uh, what did we said that was 0 0.05 tesla meters squared. If we calculate our final magnetic flux, so that's B a final cosine theta. The B is still the same. The cross-sectional area is now Y times X final. And then cosine theta. So when you plug in your numbers, you will get zero point five, one times 0 0.2, cosine of zero again. So now flux final, 0 0.5 times 0 0.2. When you do that, you would get 0 0.1 Tesla meters squared. So now to get a voltage, we have a negative change in magnetic flux over change in time. So that's negative magnetic flux final minus magnetic flux initial over T final minus T initial. So our final flux was 0 0.1, our initial flux was 0 0.05, and that took one second. So the voltage that this would generate would be 0 0.05 volts.
negative direction. So we'll talk about uh, the direction of the current and stuff in a moment. But this was kind of a long way to, to go about doing this. So I'll show you guys a shortcut. First, let's look at the shortcut to calculating this voltage. So you could do what I just did and calculate the magnetic flux initial and then the magnetic flux final and then subtract the two and divide by the time. Or and so the start of this is a little bit of calculus, but uh, by the end, I think you'll see what we're doing. So our voltage is change in flux over change in time. We're doing B dot A. The magnetic field is not changing. So I'm gonna pull that out in front. change in area over change in time. So now area is X times Y. And so is the, so if we look at X and Y, which one of those two variables is changing? So only X is changing, so we can pull the, the Y term out in front. And now we have Delta X over Delta T. So if you remember from physics one, what does change in position over change in time? What is that? Yeah. So now this just becomes negative B Y times velocity. So I'll write that over here. So for motional EMF, the voltage that you get is just B and more generally we'll call maybe this L instead of Y. Where this is the voltage. This is the magnetic field. This is the, the length of the side that isn't moving. And then this is the velocity. And so you might be given the velocity of the bar moving, and then you can just skip straight to this equation, or you might be given like the initial and the final position like I showed you, and then you can either calculate the velocity from that, or you can do the first method where you just calculate the first flux, calculate the second flux, and then divide by the time between those two things.
we need to determine the direction that the current is going to flow in that circuit. So we can calculate the voltage and therefore using Ohm's law, we could calculate the current uh, and we would know the value of that current, but now we need to know what direction it's going to flow. So we'll do the same setup. Velocity is this way. The magnetic field is coming out. So we're going to need to do some right-hand rule stuff in order to figure this out. Kind of a, maybe this will help. Uh, you don't get anything for free. So, where something is making, is moving this bar at some velocity V. If, so there has to be some, well, I guess, so if it started at rest and then we started moving at some velocity V, there would have had to have been some initial force to start moving that thing, right? If the, as we'll see in a second, uh, this, uh, depending on the direction of the current, we're going to get a force applied to the red bar. If the direction of that force were in the same direction as the velocity, then as soon as we started the red bar moving to the right, if that force were also to the right, it would just keep going forever and you would have unlimited free electricity, right? So Newton's laws, if there's no opposing force to stop it, then that force would just, that object would just keep moving. So, but unfortunately we don't have perpetual motion systems, you don't get anything for free. So there's going to have to be a force that counteracts this, the motion of this bar. So maybe I'll try to write what I just said in words. So, so we'll assume red bar starts at rest. So if it starts at rest, then some force needs to be applied. And the, so we'll do this coordinate system, X, Y, and then Z is coming out of the screen. So some force needs to be applied in the positive X direction. 
in order to start the bar moving. So we've already shown uh, through our calculations that uh, moving this bar will generate a voltage. And since we have it hooked up to a resistor, therefore a current, due to Faraday's law. We know that currents, current carrying wires in the presence of magnetic fields experience forces. So current carrying wires experience a force due to um, if in the presence of magnetic fields. Or I guess just a magnetic field. And so if that force that the magnet or the, so if the force on the red bar pointed to the right, you would get perpetual motion, which is not allowed. Therefore, the force points to the left. So again, that's one of those things, if you invent a perpetual motion device, you win a Nobel prize. So if you, if you can break physics, then you get a Nobel prize basically. Um, so these equations, this is, or, so this is just Newton's first law. The, an object at rest will stay at rest unless you, a force is acting on it. And then Moving the bar will generate a voltage or current, which was Faraday's law, which we saw. That's what we were talking about just a moment ago. Then a, a current carrying wire, which would be what the red bar is, is going to experience a force if it's in the presence of a magnetic field, that's this equation, force equals I L cross B. And then the last point is kind of coming back to Newton's first law. A little bit a little bit more than just Newton's first law, but.
So on the next slide, I'll show uh, this F, this equation to justify why the force is pointing to the left. But this is kind of the logic that I use in order to figure that out. So this is just one example. I'll show you guys some other examples and let you test this understanding to see if you can determine which way the current is going in different situations. Okay. So this isn't the only way to understand this. I'll show you a different method in a moment, but I, like I said, this is how I think about it. So I wanted to share that first. Um, so we're going to use this IL cross B on the next slide. So So using our right hand rule, we want a force that's going to the left. So you would put your and we're using this equation. So you would put your middle finger in the direction of the force, your index finger in the direction of the magnetic field, since that's the second vector in the cross product. And so you would get a current that's going down the, the red ball, right? So the current would be going in this direction. So we said F is to the left, so that's the negative J hat direction, or negative, sorry, negative X direction, so negative I hat. The L vector we said is down, which is negative j hat. And the b vector is in the positive z direction, so k hat. And so if you remember how to multiply these vectors together, this, this is true. Uh, so the way that I remember it is J cross K equals I hat. So if I put a negative sign in front of one of those vectors, then the answer is just negative. Or again, you can check with your right hand rule. So this method that I was just talking about is kind of using some logic to know what the direction of the force is needs to be and then figuring out the direction of the current based on that force. And like I said, that's the way that my brain works. Uh, now I'm gonna show you another way to think about this to arrive at the same conclusion. So. Let's 
for a moment, assume that the bar is stationary and that instead of moving the bar, we're going to increase the magnetic field. So let's say the final is greater than the initial. Okay, so then this changing flux, we're not changing the area just for this example for a moment. And we're only changing the magnetic field. And so this gets a little abstract now because magnetic flux is not a vector, but the things inside of it are a vector. And so this is similar to what we were talking about in the lab yesterday, where if you move the magnet closer to the coil, it the magnitude of the magnetic field is going to increase, but depending on whether you brought the north or the south side of the magnet closer to the coil, the value of the magnetic field might increase or decrease because um, if the magnetic field is pointing in the negative direction, then further away, let's say you had negative one Tesla, and then closer you had negative 10 Tesla. So the magnitude did increase, but because it's now a larger negative number, the value of the magnetic field is lower. So a higher magnitude, but a lower value due to magnetic field being a vector. So we're gonna apply that same kind of thinking here. If I increased the direction of the magnetic or increase so here the magnetic field is positive because it's pointing out of the screen if i increased that magnetic field then the change in the magnetic field is still positive so if i did my right hand rule with this magnetic field i would put my thumb in the direction of the magnetic field or thumb in the direction of the change in the magnetic field, which we said was positive, then my fingers would curl around counterclockwise. But then we use the negative sign from Lenz's law to say that the, the, so the curl was counterclockwise, but then the negative sign would make it go clockwise. And so that's the direction of the current. So in words, you would put your thumb in the direction of the changing magnetic field or the change in magnetic field. And your fingers curl in either clockwise or counterclockwise direction. And then the negative sign 
from Lenz's law. States that the current flows in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's do the example now where instead of the magnetic field increasing, let's say that the magnetic field is positive, but it's decreasing. So if the magnetic field is positive, but it's decreasing, then the direction of the change in the magnetic field is now going into the screen because it's negative. So the magnetic field is pointing out, but because it's de decreasing, the change in the magnetic field points into the screen. So now you would get a current, or your right-hand rule would tell you to go clockwise, and then the negative sign from Lenz's law would tell you to go counterclockwise. Okay. So in... That's it. So positive magnetic field, if it's increasing, you get a, so that was the first example we did, and you get a clockwise current, positive magnetic field, but decreasing, you got a counterclockwise current. So now what about a negative magnetic field? I'll let you guys do a negative magnetic field and we'll have it be decreasing first since that's what's written at the top. Your magnetic field points into the screen but then it's decreasing, so the change would point in the opposite direction. So your fingers would curl counterclockwise, but then the negative from Lenz's law says that they go clockwise. And then for an increasing negative magnetic field, and so by increasing, I mean increasing in magnitude, not So what direction is increasing negative magnetic field? Yeah, counterclockwise. So magnetic field into the screen, it's increasing in magnitude, so it's becoming more negative. So your chain, direction of the change in the magnetic field is still into the screen. Fingers would curl clockwise, and then the negative from Lenz's law tells you to go the other way. And so I'm going to change one word in what I wrote here, and then this is going to apply more generally. So instead of just putting your thumb in the direction of the change in the magnetic field, you put your thumb in the direction of the change in the magnetic flux. And so now, if we go back to our original example, magnetic field was out of the board or out of the screen. This thing is moving in this direction. So the magnetic flux is positive because the magnetic field was positive. And now it's increasing. So the change in the magnetic flux is still positive. Your fingers would curl counterclockwise, but then the negative side from Lenz's law would tell you that the current's flowing clockwise, which is the answer that we had gotten previously.
So like I said, there's two different ways to think about it. You can think about it this way, where you put your thumb in the direction of the change in magnetic flux, and then use your right hand rule and flip it because of that lenses law. Or you can use the logic that I was talking about where you basically have to have your force be in the opposite direction of the velocity and then figure out your direction of the current that way. Um, and so generally this kind of current that is proposing a motion is called an eddy current. Uh, so that's just kind of a vocab word, eddy current. And this has applications for things like dampening oscillations, or, uh, for example, roller coasters use magnetic braking to help slow things down. And we probably didn't notice it when we were doing the lab a couple weeks ago, but uh, the current balance. Remember, it moved around a lot. There was a set of magnets on the board and a piece of metal that was hanging down. And the, that piece of metal goes in between the magnets and it generates eddy currents that's supposed to calm down the oscillations. So, so those are the applications of these things. Uh, but what's important is all the right-hand rule stuff and then some of the calculations that we did at the beginning.